Dark Entry. That is the name of the road that leads into a forest that's said to be so perpetually black that like the road, it's called Dark Entry Forest. This strange abandoned road leads to the ruins of what was once an unassuming town with the least threatening name imaginable, Dudley Town, Connecticut. Don't be deceived by its name. You may think, what kind of fool would be scared of a place called Dudley Town? Let me assure you, it's worth staying away from. A bizarre silence fills the forest. It's said that not even birds chirp inside. One person said, it's so quiet, it feels like you're inside a recording studio. Supposed curses, mysterious disappearances, sicknesses, a beheaded nobleman all have their roots in this town of madness. As a matter of fact, despite thrill seekers constantly requesting permission to enter the dark entry forest, they are persistently turned away. Today, it's illegal to enter, and it's now privately owned. But what actually happened there? How did this all start? It all started in the late 1400s at Tower Hill with a nobleman by the name of Edmund Dudley. Dudley was the president of the King's Council to King Henry VII. One of his main responsibilities was handling the finances, and in doing so, he somehow, perhaps in a less than ethical way, became very, very rich himself. So wealthy, in fact, that when an inventory of his house was taken later on, the records are the very first reference to window curtains in history. King Henry suspected Edmund was up to something. Maybe the curtains pushed him over the edge. I don't know. But he had him arrested for suspected treason. However, before the trial took place, King Henry died. And a bunch of other people who already didn't like Dudley declared him to be guilty of treason and had him executed on Tower Hill in 1510. Edmund's family believed the execution to be unfair, and his son, John, the Duke of Northumberland, hatched a plot to bring his daughter-in-law in as Queen of England. His daughter-in-law was a woman by the name of Lady Jane Grey. The plot failed, however, and both John and Jane were also beheaded. According to legend, as the family was a group of traitors and some had been executed, which was not seen as a thing of good fortune in those days, a curse came upon the family. If you've watched my channel for a while, you know I'm not a ghost guy. But I do believe in mysteries and know that there are some strange things that happen in the world. The story of Dudley Town has both of those elements. The family lived, as far as we know, pretty much unaffected by this curse until William Dudley, one of John's descendants, moved his family to Guilford, Connecticut. Fast forward to the 1740s, to the land that is now called Dark Entry Forest. A man named Thomas Griffiths owned the land where Dudley Town would be established. In 1747, a man named Gideon Dudley purchased a piece of land from Thomas Griffiths, followed by his two brothers, Abiel and Barzillai. And they established the town and named it, you guessed it, Dudley Town. Later on, there was another man named Martin Dudley who would also come and settle in the town with the rest of them. It's said that he was from a different family line as he married Gideon's daughter. From there, according to legend, the curse of the Dudley family followed them to Dudley Town, and it became a village of the accursed. This entire story is surrounded by controversy and hotly debated. There are several historians and people who study lineages that say that while these pioneers do have the same name, there's no connection between them and the Dudleys who were executed in 1510, while others say that the connection is very clear. John Dudley's son Robert, seeing that his family wasn't exactly loved in England, traveled to America and started over. He had children who had children, all the way until Gideon and his two brothers established Dudleyville, and it was upon them that the curse finally bared its teeth. Aside from the Dudley name, there was another curse-causing issue that came up, which was the fact that the land had originally belonged to the Mohawk Nation Native Americans and was used as a burial ground. So, if you believe in the curse theory, this is double curse territory. 
Now, even though it was called Dudley Town, it was actually a small village that never reached more than 26 families. There were never any of the staple buildings one would find in a town, like churches or stores. People would travel to the nearby town of Cornwall for those things. Also, because Dudley Town was in a valley under the shadow of three mountains, the people complained that it would start to get dark by noon because the sun was already blocked. On top of that, with the fact that there was very little sun, it was incredibly difficult to grow healthy crops there. This forced people living in town to be dependent on Cornwall for all of their needs. As a matter of fact, there wasn't even a cemetery in town, and when anyone died, they would take them to Cornwall to be buried in that cemetery. Despite this, the town grew, and more settlers came, and it seemed like it was going to be a successful establishment for a few years. But then, strange things started to happen. Yes, they lived in a dark, dark forest, and yes, there were days when there were all kinds of strange, mysterious sicknesses happening in the New World. But in Dudley Town, it was just more than everywhere else. Because of this, the rumors of a curse on the town caused by the Dudley family began to emerge. The first story begins with Abiel Dudley, one of the original Dudleys who established the town. As more fruitful land opened up and were discovered throughout America, the other three Dudleys moved away from Dudley Town and lived long, prosperous lives, apparently leaving the curse behind them in the town they had established. Abiel didn't go with his brothers, though, and his fortunes were the exact opposite of his family members. It seemed like anyone who came near him risked suffering their lives or their minds. In 1792, a man named Gershon Hollister was the neighbor of Abiel Dudley, and he was murdered while building a barn for another neighbor named William Tanner. Then, William Tanner began to lose his own mind, claiming that he was seeing strange creatures come crawling out of the woods at night. Some say that this was because he was an old man. He lived to be 104 years old, but those who knew him also said that his mind was fairly sharp all the way to the end. So it was difficult to say that he was just imagining what he saw. The family of Nathan Carter had also moved to Dudley Town in 1759 in a house that Abiel Dudley had owned previously. They also faced a horrible fate. A deadly sickness swept through the families of the village of Dudley Town, and several of Nathan's relatives died. Not wanting to stay in the town where so many of his people died, Nathan took his family into the Delaware wilderness in an attempt to settle in the territory of the Native Americans. But they were attacked, and Nathan and his wife and baby were all brutally killed. Nathan's three surviving children were taken captive and forced to go to Canada. The two daughters were ransomed, but the son, David, chose to remain living with the Native Americans and even married one of the girls in the tribe. After the other Dudleys left, a series of unfortunate events plagued Abiel himself, aside from what we've already seen. Oh, by the way, don't forget to subscribe and like this video because I got some great stories to tell and it lets me know that you're here. Thanks. He personally lost everything he had, including his sanity. When he was 90 years old, he was drowning in debt so bad that the town that he helped found took his house away from him. His mental capacity continued to dissolve until he finally went totally insane and died in 1799. But the death of Abiel was not the end of the strange tragedies. In 1804, the legendary General Herman Swift, who was known as George Washington's colonel, was peacefully living in his home near Dudley Town when his wife Sarah Fay was standing on the porch and with a flash and a bang, she was struck by lightning and killed instantly. Sparked by the sudden death of the woman he loved, General Herman himself soon went insane and also died. By the end of the Civil War, the hardship of living in such a difficult area and people dying in so many mysterious ways, the people started to move away from Dudley Town. 
but a few stragglers remain. In 1901, while the town was on its last legs, a man named John Patrick Brophy faced his own terrible series of tragedies. His wife died of consumption, and not long after his funeral, his two children also vanished. Now, it should be said that some historians claim this has nothing to do with the curse, but that the two kids had been accused of stealing and skipped town to avoid swift, sweet justice. However, they were accused of stealing sleigh blankets, which would not have been that harsh of a punishment, and certainly not enough for both of them to run away and never come back. Not only did they never come back, they were never found again. Then, after that, John's house mysteriously burned to the ground, and with nothing left, John wandered into the forest alone. Some say he had gone insane and was never seen again. Finally, one of the last bastion couples to remain in the village were the Clarks. Harriet and Dr. William loved Dudley Town so much that even though everyone else had left, they decided to stay. William, being a doctor, was called away to New York for a medical emergency in 1918. He was gone for only a day and a half, but when he came back, he found that his wife had gone insane and was going on and on about being attacked by creatures from the forest. Soon, she committed suicide as well. Until this time, most of the rumors about the curse were local and just that, rumors. But in 1926, a man named Edward C. Starr wrote a book called History of Cornwall. And within this book, Edward wrote a simple two-page account of what he called the Curse of Dudley Town. And he used the phrase, Doom of Dudley Town, which was grabbed and taken by people all over the nation. Since then, the rumors continued to grow. And to this day, people regularly attempt to go into Dark Entry Forest. In modern times, with the advent of modern technology, the rumors have gone from people going insane and seeing forest creatures to seeing goblins and ghosts and aliens and even flying horses. And of course, more mysterious disappearances. While I don't doubt the mysterious disappearances and circumstances in the original accounts, I think it should be pretty obvious that a lot of the people mysteriously getting lost in the forest today are ghost hunters who don't know how to navigate the woods and are looking so hard for something spooky that they aren't paying any attention to where they're going. I'm not saying there isn't anything strange going on out there, but I think most of us can agree that a lot of things coming out of it now are just YouTubers looking for likes and hyping up everything as much as possible. And we've all seen those terrible CGI creatures supposedly lurking around the forests in some of those videos. I think it's also only fair to point out that the Cornwall Historical Society ferociously refutes all of the claims in the reports, both historically and modern, because of course they do.